Mike Brown, the former FEMA director. Joining us here is the former FEMA director. History, I think, was very unkind to you, my friend. Very unkind. Mr. Brown, thanks for being with us. This is Michael Brown Unplugged. Welcome to this episode of Michael Brown Unplugged. Glad to have you with me. I want to talk a, a little inside baseball for a minute about the impeachment process that's going on regarding the House of Representatives under the leadership of Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump as President of the United States. This is a classic separation of powers issue that is squarely determined by the language of the Constitution, which gives the House of Representatives the right to and and, and the, the obligation to impeach a federal official President, vice president, a um, uh, a federal judge. There, are several federal judges have been impeached in the past. Obviously, attempts at impeaching presidents have have failed. But what's going on right now? I think that people need to understand is truly an indication of how far off base both the media and, and in this case, I mean, I I don't want to sound partisan because I really want to make this a to help you understand why I believe what they're doing is consti- is failing constitutional muster and is leading to a, leading down a very dangerous path of ignoring past constitutional precedent and establishing new precedent for what might be called a star chamber. So let's get started. The Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi's, her, her latest refusal to allow a formal vote on impeaching President Trump has a lot of legal experts, including me, worrying that a modern version of England's famous Star Chamber Court is beginning to emerge in the United States. Now, for historical perspective, the Star Chamber Court met secretly, afforded defendants no due process, they delivered verdicts that you could not appeal, they meted out punishment that was more often than not barbaric, and the the star chamber was especially feared during the 16th and 17th centuries, and its unrestrained cruelty was among the reasons that the Puritans migrated to this country. But back on August, on August, on October 15, Pelosi rejected an increasingly angry Republican demand for an up-and-down vote in the House of Representatives on opening what I would call a formal impeachment process. The Speaker said that we will not be having a vote. Now, a vote would require all 435 members of the House to go on record one way or the other on the impeachment issue. Now, let me add a parenthetical here. I think most people believe that if the Speaker were to hold a vote, she would get the necessary majority because the Democrats hold a majority in the House of Representatives. She would get the necessary votes to open a formal impeachment inquiry. And I don't think that any Republicans would vote for it. Now, the reason Republicans may not vote for it, I mean, there's a political reason. They wouldn't vote for it because it would make the impeachment a purely partisan effort, only Democrats voting for it. On the other hand, I think there's an opportunity here for Republicans, if they could get the caucus together, for all Republicans to join the Democrats in voting for a formal impeachment inquiry. And the reason I say that is that would be like, I mean, that that is a way of calling the Democrats bluff and saying, okay, if you want to impeach this, impeach the president, we're going to vote with you. Doesn't mean that they support the impeachment, but we're going to vote with you on opening a formal impeachment inquiry. The footnote that I want to give you here is, the reason I think Republicans ought to, ought to consider that is, if Republicans vote in favor of a formal impeachment inquiry, That almost mandates, that forces the hands of the Democrats to open up this process so that the entire American public can watch watch what's going on. For example, I want to go to a story real quickly in the Washington Examiner written by Byron York in which he describes this. Just bear with me. 
In a secret interview, Congressman Adam Schiff, the leader of the House Democratic effort to impeach President Trump, pressed former United States Special Representative to Ukraine, Kurt Volker, to testify that Ukrainian officials felt pressured to investigate former Vice President Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, as a result of Trump withholding U.S. military aid to Ukraine. Now, in this secret interview, Volker denied that that was the case. He noted that Ukrainian leaders did not even know the aid was being withheld and that they believed their relationship with the United States was moving along satisfactorily without, without them having done anything that Trump mentioned in that notorious July, 25, July 25th phone conversation with Ukraine President Zelensky. And in this secret meeting, Volker repeatedly declined to agree to Schiff's characterization of events. Schiff said that, Ambassador, you're making this much more complicated than it has to be. Here's what bugs me about this, and I've actually been in this room. The interview took place October 3rd in a secure room in the United States, in the United States Capitol. And while the session covered several topics, the issue of the alleged quid pro quo U.S. military aid in exchange for a Ukrainian investigation of the Bidens and a public announcement that such an investigation was underway was a significant part of the discussion. How do we know about this? We only know about it because a source in that secret meeting told Byron York about it, and he wrote about it in the Washington Examiner. That's not how to conduct business particularly when you're considering impeachment. And let, you know what? I probably need to define impeachment. I was reminded on the radio program a couple of days ago that many people may not understand what impeachment is. Impeachment is like an indictment. And the House of Representatives are the ones that do the indictment. So if a majority of members of the House vote to impeach Donald Trump, That does not mean that Donald Trump is removed from office. It simply means that they have decided that the president, in their estimation, in their opinion, has committed high crimes and misdemeanors. So it's much like a prosecutor investigating a potential defendant and coming to the conclusion that the actions of that defendant meet all of the elements required for whatever the crime is that the prosecutor is going to charge this defendant with. That's what the House of Representatives is doing. They're making a decision, or they're in the process of making a decision, that the President of the United States committed high crimes and misdemeanors, and that he should be, and I'm putting air quotes around this, he should be indicted. But in terms of the Constitution, it means that he should be impeached. What does that mean? It simply means that a majority of the House of Representatives has made the determination that their belief is the president has committed high crimes and misdemeanors, and now they have to put together their case and present it to the United States Senate, where a majority of senators present, no two-thirds, no 51 vote, a majority of the senators present in a trial that is overseen by the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. See how see how the founders put this perfect symmetry together in terms of separation of powers? You have the House of Representatives and the executive branch making the decision whether or not to impeach. Then that goes to the United States Senate, still within the legislative branch. And they have to make a determination based upon evidence that will be presented by what are called house managers. The house managers, much like prosecutors, have to march across to the other side of the the United States Capitol. And in a public trial, they have to present their evidence and make their case to the United States Senate in a trial that is being conducted under the auspices of the Supreme of, of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and then based upon that evidence, a majority of the senators present have to decide and have to vote whether or not the case presented by the House of Representatives is strong enough that a majority of the senators present vote to then remove the president 
from office. Now, this is significant. Removing a president from office is, yes, it's conducted in, a, in an adjudicatory manner within, a, within the legislative branch. They are adjudicating whether or not the president committed high crimes and misdemeanors. So the House, the House has to, in layman's terms, indict the president, and then the United States Senate, operating under the guidance of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Listen to that evidence. The House makes their case, and then a major- and then a majority of the senators present either vote to remove the president or vote not to remove the president. And you may recall, in the case of Bill Clinton, they did not get a, a majority of the senators present to vote to remove Bill Clinton. So that's kind of the process. So let's go back to that October 15th statement by the Speaker of the House where she said that we're not going to have a formal vote. The Republicans get angry. They demand an up-and-down vote in the House on opening a formal impeachment process. And Pelosi said in response to that, we will not be having a vote. A formal vote would require all 435 members of the House to go on record one way or the other on the impeachment issue. Now, approval, and here's, to me, here is, here's why this process, the way it's being conducted now, is almost the equivalent of a star chamber. Approval of a formal impeachment inquiry would then afford the president due process protections that are currently being denied by Pelosi, by having this informal process. The informal process with House Select Committee on Intelligence Chairman Adam Schiff that I just referenced in the Byron York article at center stage functions almost entirely behind closed doors with Democrats only promising the release of transcripts sometime in the future, in some indeterminate time in the future. That's not fair to the president, but here's more importantly, it's not fair to the American public. The the American public is entitled, remember, all power under our Constitution, not granted to the not not granted to the federal government, or reserved to the states, all other power is reserved to the people. We are their bosses, and we are entitled to know what our employees are doing, particularly with respect to the idea of removing a duly elected president. But for now, House Democrat leaders are keeping this tight lid on their impeachment drive, even to the point on October 15 of cutting off the microphone of House Minority Leader Stephen Scalise as he asked on the House floor, quote, if the House had been authorized to conduct an impeachment inquiry into President Trump, microphone cut off. The day before that, Congressman Matt Getz, a Republican from Florida, tried to attend a closed meeting of Schiff's panel hearing testimony, but he was locked out of it. He later wrote on Twitter, To exclude members of Congress from hearings confirms the American people's suspicions. This is not a legitimate impeachment inquiry. It's a charade. And that's my point. It's turning into a star chamber. The closed doors have civil rights law experts such as Hans von Spivosky of the Heritage Foundation's Foundation's Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. It has him noting that star chamber oppression, especially during the reigns of King Henry VII and Charles I, prompted our founding fathers to include incredibly strong due process guarantees in the Constitution. He said, quote, We established basic rules of due process in this country in order to avoid the way things had been done in England with secret anonymous accusations, with witnesses that you could not confront or that you could not cross-examine. Continuing his quote, I mean, all, all the kinds of things, the way the star chambers operated, and even though impeachment is not a legal prosecution or a legal case in the courts, It is nonetheless a serious undertaking with such substantial consequences, parenthetically, removal of a duly elected president, that those same basic rules of due process should apply even more so than in the court. 
Other than declaring war, he says, there is no more serious undertaking by the House of Representatives than impeachment because they are they are removing, they are voting to remove, they're voting to move to the Senate a duly elected president, and overturning the choices of the American electorate. I think he's kind of misquoted a little bit because what the House is doing, they're voting to take it to the Senate. The Senate is the group that ultimately votes whether or not to remove the president. But I get his point. Mark Fitzgibbons, he's president of corporate affairs for the Virginia-based American Target Advertising. He's an expert in federal administrative law. He says that, quote, comparisons of this secretive, unconstitutional impeachment process to the Star Chamber are appropriate because impeachment is an adjudicative process, as I said earlier, not a legislative process, even though it is being conducted by Congress. The process to date, he says, violates constitutional rights by, at a minimum, prohibiting confrontation of witnesses and violating due process. It has become a dangerous mockery of the constitutional process. A former counsel to Senator Rand Paul, Brian Darling, an authority on congressional rules, says, The fact that the House Democrats are departing from precedent shows this is not a fair process and that President Trump will be impeached by the House no matter what the evidence is presented to the contrary. The great risk for Democrats is that the American people correctly discern this to be a wholly partisan effort. But I want to go to my favorite law professor, Jonathan Turley, George Washington University law professor Jonathan Turley. Do you know why he's my favorite law professor and favorite talking head? He is a... He he is a... Liberal. In terms of of public policy, he's on the left. I'm on the right. But you know what we agree upon? We agree upon constitutional principles. And he has warned recently that both parties in Congress, that the Constitution allows the House to conduct an impeachment under whatever rules it chooses. But having said that, he criticizes the Speaker for not having a formal vote. He wrote this, the current impeachment inquiry rests on the authority of one person until the entire body, meaning the entire House of Representatives, until the entire body votes, it remains the Pelosi impeachment effort rather than a House impeachment process. The professor is is exactly right. And he says, quote, on its face, The Constitution does not require anything other than a majority vote of the House to impeach a president. It is silent. The Constitution is silent on the procedures used to reach that vote. And the courts, rightly so, have largely deferred to Congress to create its own internal rules and processes in fulfilling constitutional functions. Now, he testified before the House Judiciary Committee back in May And he cited Eastland versus United States servicemen. The court in that case said this. The wisdom of congressional approach or methodology is not open to judicial veto, nor is the is the legitimacy of a congressional inquiry to be defined by what it produces. The very nature of the investigative function, like any research, is that it takes the searchers up some blind alleys and into nonproductive enterprises. To be a valid legislative inquiry, there there need be no predictable end result. The court was exactly right. In this case, the House can do, even if they want to conduct a secret inquiry, they can do so. My argument is this. When I went through my congressional investigations, there was a time when I appeared before the House Committee for Depositions. That was behind closed doors. It was behind closed doors because both House Republicans and House Democrats wanted to have their lawyers depose me and ask me questions in private so that they can make a determination about the questions they wanted to ask me in a public hearing. 
Now, you might think that's a distinction without a difference, but I think it's very important because what's going on now with Adam Schiff's committee are not depositions. They are, they are talking to witnesses from the executive branch. I was not a member of the executive branch at that time. I was a private citizen. And they wanted to ask me questions to understand what I knew, kind of the uh, what did you know and when did you know what kind of inquiry, so they could then, in a bipartisan effort, because there were Republicans and Democrats present in those depositions, so they could then take that information into a public hearing and ask their questions. What's going on with Adam Schiff is he's not conducting depositions so that he can then have an open hearing. This is the hearing. The hearing's being conducted in secret, and that's wrong, just absolutely wrong. Now, there are some Democratic Hill veterans that support Pelosi's approach, but they actually worry about how the public sees it. Jim Manley, who's a former communications director for Senator Harry Reid, said that, you know, like the speaker, I'm a bit agnostic on this. Despite what the Republicans say, a vote to begin the process is not needed. But the fact that House Democrats couldn't agree simply to get this out of the way shows weakness to me. I think it shows more than weakness. I think it shows that they know that they don't have anything right now. The public needs to know that. The public needs to be able to make their own decision about whether or not this president should be impeached. They need to hear these hearings. They need to be able to see the hearings. Even more importantly, the media needs to be able to report on the hearings. Not doing so is like a star chamber. They're conducting the hearings in secret to do the most serious thing other than declare war that the House of Representatives can do, and that's to vote on articles of impeachment to send to the United States Senate for a trial and ultimately, potentially, the removal of a duly elected president. Having been through this process, congressional hearings, depositions, all of that, I'm of a mind that the more we have conducted in public, the better off we are. Because I truly believe that the American public, John Q. public out there, can handle the truth. Whether you support Trump, whether you oppose Trump, whether you're agnostic, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, can't we simply agree that if we're going to go down this path, particularly as we're coming upon an election time, an election season, that the right thing to do, the proper thing to do, is to conduct all of these hearings in public. Because when it comes time for the House to vote whether or not to impeach the president, public opinion is going to have a bearing on that. And if they do vote to impeach the president, and that goes to the United States Senate, public opinion is going to have a bearing on that. You can't have public opinion if you conduct everything in secret. That's not the American way. And whether you like Donald Trump or you despise Donald Trump, both the president and those around him, the ambassadors, the national security people, the White House Situation people, the White House Situation Room people, all of these individuals that may or may not be called to testify, they deserve their chance to be heard in public so that you and I can make a judgment about their credibility and the fairness of this process. That's the American way. Adam Schiff, Speaker Pelosi, open these hearings. 